Y'all, at 18, I knew I had to leave Central Appalachia if I was going to become the performing artist that I was just beginning to dream of. So when I graduated high school and I told my gran and my mom and my pap that I wanted to leave the land of the Shawnee and the Cherokee and move to New York City, they knew because they'd already lived it with me. They knew I needed more fertile soil if I was going to become the woman we hoped. That day at the airport, that was the first time I saw my papa cry. But they put aside their fear of loss because they hoped that I would finally live in a, a city where I could be happy, my identity affirmed and non-threatening, and I could be creative without shame. Now, would you say my early life was difficult? There were some people who got me and supported me in my mom's dance studio. There, my identity of single parent home, mixed race, daughter of a Vietnam vet, daughter of artists, was okay. Yet, there were plenty of experiences that impressed on me. There wasn't space for my complex identity within the dominant narrative. Didn't fit the box. It was too confusing, and it was just easier for him to sideline me. So moving to New York City felt like I found my Mecca. I mean, or at least there were so many people walking by on the streets affirming that there are millions of ways to be human. Yes. So I did the Fashion Institute of Technology. I rode the C train to Alvin Ailey. I rode the two to steps. I started auditioning. Then I had an injury. Then I started acting. And then I started going back and forth to New York and Los Angeles. And then I began to see the entertainment industry didn't have space for complex identities either. Only certain storylines, certain characters. Whoa, I'm not interested. My mom was mad and worried. And then I hit the stuck place. I wasn't doing anything performing arts related. I was in this relationship with this brilliant photographer who treated me terribly, not physically, but he definitely played mind games with me. My depression had set in. I hit a brick wall. I was stuck. One of my homies called me, and he was like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything you planned for your life. I was like, he was telling me some hard stuff I just really wasn't trying to hear at the time, and I got so mad at him, I hung up on him, and I just remember walking over to my desk in my apartment in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and I grabbed this piece of paper, and I wrote my response to him. My life has been driven or derailed by those systems and individuals who try to keep me, my family, from existing as a harmonious whole. I'm left with nothing to do but go deep within my spirit to find the place where my crying began. And then the earth-jolting event of the World Trade Centers. It was like everything external and international hit the circuits of my personal internal world. All my identities, the micro, the macro, converged within me and woke a sleeping dragon. For the first time, I started seeing a counselor. His question that cracked my whole story wide open. He said, what about your dad? Oh no, my father. He hasn't been around in over 26 years. He's a Vietnam vet. His mom signed him out of the VA mental hospital in 1978. She bought him a one-way ticket to Hawaii, and nobody's ever seen him since, and it's just been me and my mom, and she held it down. So don't ask me about my dad, all right? He was shining a light on a path to liberation that I wasn't even aware of. That night I went home and I got out this photo album my mom made of my dad. And it's got these pictures of him before, during, and after the Vietnam War. I looked at him with different eyes. I immersed myself in his letter. She's due in three weeks. Her family just found out about a month ago. I'm not going to be there when my baby comes into the world. Being here is making me think a lot about what kind of father I want to be. 
Every day I'm here, I can just feel my mind getting blacker. I don't know if y'all can really dig where I'm coming from, but I want this baby to be proud of me because I know who I am and where I come from. Man, it's all a trip. Nah, we haven't decided on a name yet. I told Yvonne if it's a boy, name him for Drell. Now y'all keep saying if it's a girl and she's gonna be Foxy, name her Carmen. Oh, here comes that lieutenant again, damn. I had no idea that my father ever thought about me in that way. He thought a lot about his baby to come. And I'm in the counselor's office dealing with deep-rooted issues of rejection and abandonment, and he's telling me that me having a father who was non-responsive and growing up in the community that I did set me up for this. Huh? Early impressions shape the templates of your brain, affecting your ability to seize moments in your life, those times when you didn't feel safe, or your voice was silenced. I could hardly comprehend what he was saying. I knew that I needed to look back. My future depended on it. 1969, young men fighting for a country that they didn't believe really supported them. They were intensely trying to maintain a sense of pride Brother, what you need to do is start seeing yourself as a black man. It is time to stand up. Black power, black power, black power. My father was Appalachian and Negro. That's what they said back then. A double whammy of a label. Got him a round trip ticket to Vietnam, baby. During those times, Central Appalachia had some of the highest numbers of young men drafted to fight in the war. Severe post-traumatic stress syndrome, schizophrenia. That didn't mean anything to me as a kid. I just thought my dad was weird and scary. But what that diagnosis really meant was that I would never have a father sitting at the dinner table with me and my mom, ever leaving me feeling very isolated and alone. It also meant that my mom was the one who was gonna have to help me understand why the kids at my new school were giving me such a hard time. Where's the new girl from? From here, stupid. She is my dance teacher's daughter. You know me, Sivani Cave with the ladies of dance studio down on South Third Street? Okay, who's her dad? She is tan because she is part Hawaiian? Who does she think she is? Well, she thinks she's cute hanging out with all them white kids. Y'all know that wasn't going anywhere but to a fight. And that was every day in my first year in public school. At my lowest point, I wrote, Dear Mom, I can't take this anymore. Everywhere I go, kids make fun of me. Why can't I be me? I'm black and I'm white and I'm part Indian. I hate my dad. He left me here to deal with this all by myself. I don't know yet how I'm gonna kill myself, but by the time you find me, I'll be gone. I love you more than you know, Mitzi. So what happens if being accepted by your tribe or your community only looks like X? but then you're not X. Eventually, that can lead to intense self-rejection. And then where did that lead to? Contemplating suicide. So back to the stuck point. Back in New York City, I'm with a counselor. I'm unraveling the intimate and the historical. There's protests in the streets, oncoming war in Iraq. My heart told me I needed to find my father. I needed to see him face to face. So I took the photo album and it took me two trips to Honolulu and I hit the beaches on the streets and in the shelters. And I finally found him. <laughs> Seeing him 
face to face was amazing and devastating all at once. How his life had been destroyed and nobody seemed to know or even care. And then knowing how my mom and our life was affected by that, that was an intense reality to digest. I'm living in the promise that I made to God then. I will do everything within my power to tell the world that he existed, give voice to his story and to my families. The deep need I had in my body to speak truth, give voice to his story was so intense in my body I couldn't hold it. Why should I? I didn't create racism. I didn't create the conflict in Vietnam or the class divide. My only vital route forward was to activate my inheritance of a daughter of artists, do what New York City taught me, write my own story and invite many to bear witness. Finally, that was a play that I wanted to be part of. 15 different characters telling the story about a daughter from central Appalachia and her search to find her father missing since the Vietnam War. Now, what I never expected. Each continent or community that I performed, people stood to affirm their compassion for my truth. They held space for my pain. They weren't afraid of it. I received so many tear-filled hugs I mean, I never imagined that spending every dime that I had to find my father and then to produce it, that my production team and my audiences, they were making space for me to claim my power. I mean, everybody involved, they had space for my pain and the possibility of my wholeness, art and community recalibrated my consciousness and gave space for celebrating complex identities. I wanted to do that for everybody. I was like, maybe there are other people who would value this intergenerational identity work. So I started facilitating workshops across the country where we creatively and bravely explore our identity together. What's your story? And so as the world has continued to evolve, and I'm back home now, we've been flooded with violent images, no justice. I had that feeling again. How to impress upon the psyche of an entire community the power of possibility. So the kids and the staff at the daycare center, the small business incubator, the board of directors, their staff, and two incredible muralists painted elements of black history in a completely new image. We did it. We shifted the lens. And in live performance and word, illuminating our history, standing tall in community, projecting the possibility of an empowered future. It's time to elevate in just and loving ways Please, keep your heart open to the truth. Our humanity is there. Our future is there. Our power and our joy. Thank you.